Our pursuit of the wines and cultures of Chile in February of 2023 takes us to the western coast of South America on the Pacific Ocean. We land in Santiago, Chile's capital city, located between the ocean and the Andes Mountains in the middle of the country. Our hotel, the Intercontinental Santiago, is located in the financial district in an affluent section of Santiago known as Las Condes. This busy convention hotel gave us a comfortable, stylish home base from which to do our sightseeing. The metropolitan region of Santiago has a population of 7 million, making it one of South America's largest urban areas. About 40% of Chile's total population lives here. Little wonder Santiago hosts the regional headquarters of many multinational corporations and even a French sidewalk cafe, tucked in among those of many other nationalities. My old college friend Tony Quinn had already started tasting the local wines and marveling at the weather. It's beautiful summer weather in February. <laughs> we found the U.S. Embassy just a couple of blocks away from our hotel. Sad to say, you can usually spot a U.S. Embassy by its high walls and fortress-like presence. As we set out to see the city, we paused in Bicentennial Park, which is home to many birds, and even a most impressive and inviting fruit tree. It's called an ambu tree, meaning that it's a tree that gives drink. Well, unless it was wine, we weren't interested. As we began our drive in this bustling capital city, we found a comfortable mix of architecture, old and new. And of course, we found head-scratching monuments such as this one of an archangel holding a torch while posing beside a lion. The Chilean National Museum of Fine Arts was our first stop. And its first floor was devoted to classical statuary. The building alone was worth the visit. Though the museum was established in 1880, making it the oldest in South America, the current building is newer. Known as the Palace of the Fine Arts, it was opened in 1910 to commemorate the first centennial of the independence of Chile. The design was by Chilean architect Emile Juquier in what is called a Beaux-Arts style. By the time we got upstairs, the exhibits were expanded to feature contemporary South American and Chilean paintings. As we stepped outside the museum, we found the Greek god Daedalus grieving over the death of Icarus, whose wings melted when he flew too close to the sun. And across the way is a monument commemorating the centennial of Chile, given by Chile's French colony. As Chile's capital city, Santiago is home to the judicial and executive branches of national government. But the legislative branch meets an hour away in the much smaller city of Valparaiso. We'll visit there later. But first, here is Chile's Justice Courts Palace, which is the seat of Chile's Supreme Court. The 19th century neoclassical style is in evidence here, as well as at La Moneda Palace, which serves as the seat of the president of Chile. I like to think of it as Chile's White House. Here's another justice building, the Ministry of Justice and Human Rights. In front stands a statue of Salvador Allende Gosens, who was the first Marxist to be elected president in a liberal democracy in South America. Allende died in 1973. With that, we adjourned to a welcome meal that easily fit all 12 of us around a single table. This was one of many wonderful meals we would share on our trip, always accompanied by local wine. Santiago is just an hour from the Andes Mountains and an hour to the Pacific Ocean. In heading northwest toward the coastal city of Valparaiso, we pass through the Casablanca Valley, lush with vineyards. High on a hill, we see Vina Indomita, a fancy winery and high-end restaurant, 
reservations required. But we made a more practical stop at a roadside store that offers a wide selection of Chilean wines, some surprisingly affordable. At the time of our visit, 1,000 Chilean pesos was worth about a dollar and a quarter in U.S. currency. <laughs> I'll bet you're doing a little mental arithmetic right now. Well, back on the road, our Chilean guide, Juan Pablo, we called him JP, began preparing us for our next destination, the quirky port city of Valparaiso. Tourists love the colorful, artsy atmosphere, and you'll soon see why. We happened to drive in during one of the many street markets in which vendors spread their wares along the side of the road for block after block. We didn't stop to shop, since we were on our way to reach a high point where we could get oriented from the top looking down. That vantage point was La Sebastiana, the hilltop home of Nobel Prize winning poet Pablo Neruda. The socialist diplomat and politician died in 1973, but the multi-level house he built is now a museum. From the top, we had a commanding view of homes perched on the hillside going all the way down to the port below. More about that port later. Now it's time to absorb the culture of the city. Street culture, that is. Valpo, as they call Valparaiso, has actually encouraged street art. It's not your common everyday graffiti, but its proliferation has made this bohemian part of the city an ever-changing art gallery. JP served as our docent, referring reverently to the paintings as we explored several levels of the terraced city. Don't worry, common graffiti is often painted over and nobody objects. But good paintings are respected and preserved. Some of the paintings tell stories. A few make political statements. Others inspire visitors to get silly. Still others celebrate nature or make you wonder, what was the artist thinking? There's talent on these walls. Over time, wall-to-wall -wall artistry has established Valpo as a unique tourist destination. Commissioned works even appear on high-rise buildings. Our tour group was so taken by the message of this painting, we struck a pose above it. If you like cable cars in San Francisco, you'll love funiculars in Valparaiso. There are anywhere from 16 to 22 of these ascensiores, that's Spanish for elevators, taking residents and tourists up and down the steep hillsides every day. We were aboard the oldest one, Ascensor Concepcion, on our way down to the waterfront. We had great views of the harbor going down. Today, Valparaiso is the number one port for container ships and cruise lines in Chile, handling 10 million tons of freight a year and welcoming 150,000 passengers. Before the Panama Canal was built in 1914, Valparaiso was even more important as a port of call for commercial freighters. From this tower, a harbor master maintains control over port activity. A similar, almost matching tower is nearby attached to a building that houses government offices and commercial shipping companies. These towers provide a visual entryway to Plaza Sotomayor, whose focal point is an elaborate monument to fallen Chilean sailors who were killed in the 1879 War of the Pacific. One entire side of the plaza is taken up by Chile's naval headquarters, bearing the name Armada de Chile. It was no surprise that Valparaiso's love of street markets had spread to Plaza Sotomayor. We couldn't resist the temptation to check it out. On our way out of town, we paused to check the time at a most impressive floral clock. It 
it's almost four o'clock. Time to head back to Santiago. We'd be leaving for Santa Cruz the next day. Our drive from Santiago south to Santa Cruz in the Colchagua Valley takes us through the heart of Chile's prime wine producing region. The Hotel Santa Cruz Plaza proved to be a worthy sightseeing destination in and of itself. The facility was comfortably intimate with dramatic Spanish colonial decor. The grounds and pool were richly landscaped, creating a most relaxing setting. Of course, there were amenities you might expect to find at any high-end vacation resort. A choice of bars and places to dine, a beauty spa, a gym, and special facilities for children. But we didn't expect to find a full-fledged casino. And we certainly didn't expect to find one of the most multifaceted museums in Chile, Museo de Colchagua. Its eclectic collection ranged from pre-Columbian art, archaeological specimens, and colonial-era antiques to rich religious treasures. We even found an elaborate funeral carriage. And when we went outside, we discovered what we took to be a tractor and probably a fire engine. A special exhibit in the museum recreated the Chile mining accident of 2010 in which 33 workers were rescued 69 days after the mine's collapse. They were trapped nearly a half mile underground until Chilean engineers devised a capsule that was used to bring them out one at a time. All survived. It turns out this entire property, the hotel, the casino, the museum, is the brainchild of one man and his foundation. Carlos Cardoan is a wealthy Chilean arms merchant and manufacturer who happens to be an avid collector of art and antiquities. His wide-ranging taste is evident everywhere in the hotel. And sometimes is a little disturbing. But we savored some unique experiences during our stay, such as learning how to mix a pisco sour using Chilean brandy. We were even introduced to Chile's national dance, the Cueca. In retrospect, the Hotel Santa Cruz Plaza certainly proved to be an amazing and delightful place to stay. Our Santa Cruz sightseeing began with a visit to the vineyard that produces Atlas Conquest, a sturdy red wine that is the perfect accompaniment to a Chilean barbecue. They call it an asado. The star of an asado is beef, pork, chicken, or sausage grilled over an open fire and accompanied by salads and side dishes of various kinds. Our gang made the most of the occasion, enjoying a warm summer day in February under a tent. But wait, how did I get stuck behind a camera? Don't worry, I got the leftovers and they were delicious. Some of us even came back for seconds. Following lunch, we met the prize-winning center of attention at a Chilean rodeo, or as they say in Chile, a rodeo. We had just dined at one of many local rodeo clubs found throughout the country, but we weren't going to see bulldogging, bucking broncos, or tie-down roping as we would in North America. Here, the spotlight is on how well the rider and horse perform in a very prescribed way. Actually, there are two cowboys that make up a team. In Chile, they're called huasos, and the action takes place in a crescent-shaped corral called a media luna. When a steer is released into the corral, the huasos must drive it around the side, pinning it against large cushions. They're given three chances, with points given for doing it properly, and deductions for faults. Hopefully, no one gets hurt. The sport is dripping with tradition and was declared the national sport in 1962. 
only Chilean horses can be used, and the riders must wear traditional Huaso clothing. We were surprised to learn that the popularity of rodeo is second only to that of soccer in Chile, and that in 2004, more spectators attended rodeo events than professional football matches. Not bad for a game that started in Spanish colonial times and was nurtured as part of traditional Chilean peasant festivals. It's the next day and time for lunch again. This time in a private rural home or pueblo in the tiny town of La Lao. While overlooking the family's expansive backyard, we enjoyed a traditional Chilean lunch served by a welcoming mother and her lovely daughters. We then passed through more vineyards on our way to the most unusual wine tasting I had ever experienced. It was a highlight of our trip. View Manent in the Colchagua Valley is family run, going back for generations to its founding by a Spanish immigrant from Catalonia. Our orientation started with the usual discussion of climate and soil, but became tangible when we wandered through a well-organized varietal garden. Predictably, the nearby visitor center offered a purchase opportunity. But our visit became very special and unique when we climbed aboard a horse-drawn carriage to tour the vineyards. This is only one of View Manent's three vineyards, from which it produces award-winning red, white, and rosé styles with an emphasis on purely Chilean Malbec and Carbonier. You, uh, are you harvesting now or is it too early? We started on Sunday. Oh, okay. wow. yeah, we just begun. It turns out our harvest timing was good. Instead of the usual tasting session, we were given a little craft project, a competition really. Our guide split us into two teams, gave each member four different red wines to taste, and challenged us to create the best blend we could. Judging would be by View Manent's professional wine tasters, who would also judge us on presentation and label. In addition to Malbec and Carbonier, our ingredients included Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc. My team was definitely savoring the task under the assumed leadership of Tony Quinn, our Napa Valley veteran. But my known dislike of Cabernet Sauvignon got me booted from the mixing task and assigned in exile to design the bottle label. I sat at a lonely table where I stared at blank scraps of paper and fiddled with marking pens. All I knew was I wanted something lively and fun. Out of the blue, it came to me. All that jazz. My team was ready with its secret brew and enthusiastically applied the label I came up with. They were even inspired to do a high-kicking dance in presenting all that jazz to the judges. Then we waited. And waited. Finally, uh, the, the verdict. The judges uh, really enjoy the presentations on the wines, of course, but there must always be a winner. Uh, and in this case, because of the blend, although it was uh, kind of a secret blending, um, the, and that the presentation needed some more work, although it had a lot of potential. The winner is all the jazz. The prize for each winning team member was a box containing two bottles of wine, one of them bearing a reproduced copy of our winning All That Jazz label. Being good sports, we counted on the other team to help us consume the bounty, a challenge they eagerly undertook as we ended our wonderful visit to Chile.